Okay, so we did exponential, exponential functions and log functions and how to derive them. Uh, so now what we're going to look at are applications of exponentials and logarithms. So in this section 3.3, we're going to look at uninhibited and limited growth models. So we want to be able to find functions that satisfy uh, this standard form, this, the derivative of p is equal to kp. Uh, convert between growth rate and doubling time, solve application problems using exponential growth and limited growth models. Bunch of gibberish, but we'll figure it out, okay? So what we want to do is start by looking at uh, the function 5e to the 4x. So if our function is 5e to the 4x, what is the derivative of that function? So remember that if f of x equals e to the x, then f prime is just e to the x, or e to the u let's say y equals e to the u, then y prime is equal to e to the u, u prime. Okay, so what's 5e to the 4x going to be? What's its derivative going to be? 20e to the 4x because you're just looking at 5e to the 4x and then the derivative of 4x, which is 4. Right, that's the same thing as saying 5e to the 4x, 4. Because the constant stays there, e to the 4x stays there, and then the derivative of 4x is 4. Okay? All right. So if we have a function that satisfies this equation, if the derivative is equal to uh, k times y, where we've just got a constant, this is true if and only if y is equal to c times e to the kx. Okay, th this just tells us if, we, if our derivative is equal to k times y, then y has to be this exponential function, just like we just did. Some number times e to something. Okay? It's the only way to get this answer. Okay? Example. Y equals 2e to the 3x. Two e to the three x. So here c is equal to two, k is equal to three. All right? We know that if we take the derivative of this, it's going to be 6 e to the 3x. Well, isn't that just 3 times 2 e to the 3x, which is k y? Okay, so it fits. This is basically our theorem saying that if it fits this, taking the derivative equals to k times y, then it has to be in the form of an exponential. It's the only time that that happens. All right, so find the general form of the function that satisfies this equation. So we want to find the general form of the function that satisfies this equation. So I know that if dy dx equals ky, then y equals c e to the kx. Right? So what's the general form of the function that has to satisfy this? Here we have a and a, just like we have y and y. So in this function, k is equal to 5, right? we see that? So that means that our function a, we know it's going to be a function of t, not of x, and k is going to be 5, so it's going to be c e to the 5t. Now it doesn't matter what c is, it'll still work for every value of c. Okay.
we've just got d to the n, uh, the derivative of n with respect to t equals kn. So what's the general form of this one going to be? We know it's going to be an exponential, right? We know it's going to be c times e to the something t. What's k in this term, in this example? It's just k, right? So n has to be c e to the k t. Okay. Now, this equation is the basic model for uh, unrestrained population growth. So, if there's nothing, you know, if there's no bears in the woods, we're talking about how the deer population might be. You know, it, it would be restricted if you had, you know, natural predators thinning the herd. Uh, but for an uninhibited population growth, this is what happens. Okay, happens with people, happens with bacteria, uh, compounded interest. It's a good example of uninhibited population growth. Okay, so the only function that satisfies that equation, of course, is that exponential function. So we can think about this as being uh, our population is modeled as c e to the kt. Okay, c in this case, we're going to change that term to p sub naught. Okay, that's what p sub naught. Generally, what that means, anytime you put a sub naught on something, you know, that zero subscript, it just means an initial value or an initial uh, constraint. In this case, population zero. That's going to be basically our initial population. Because what happens if I let time t equal 0? If t equals 0, then e to the 0 is just 1, and all I have is p naught. It's what happens at time t equals 0. So that's our initial value. When we're talking about population, that tends to be our initial uh, population. Okay, so if I had a, a culture, a bacterial culture that started with 300 uh, bacteria, that would be p sub naught. And then if I wanted to see what the population was at some other time, I would use my model using p naught as the c, basically. All right? Now, let's look at this example. Say we have an amount, uh, p sub naught, in dollars, and it's invested in a savings account where the interest is compounded continuously at 7% per year. So we're given this d sub p or dp of uh, dt equals 0 0.07p. So what's k in this? k is 0 0.07. What is c? Remember, c becomes p0, right? For these values that have an initial value, our c is going to be our initial value, p sub naught. And that's what they give us, p sub naught. It's whatever amount we're investing. So what's our formula going to be for p? It's going to be p sub naught e to the rt. And if we remember our interest formulas, compounding interest was PERT, right? Principal times e to the RT. Principal is just what you started with, p sub naught. It's how much you invested. So that works out with the interest formula that we already knew. All right, so f suppose that we invest $100. How much will we have after one year? P sub naught e to the RT. So what's P sub naught? 100. What is our rate? What is our K here? 0 0.07 and time is T is 1. 
So we just have 100 times e to the 0 0.07, which I don't have my calculator, but. Hundred times one point oh seven two five eight, so we get one hundred seven point two five. So in a year at seven percent interest, compounding continuously, you get seven dollars and a quarter per hundred dollars. Well, now you wouldn't even say that. You would just say. With an initial investment of $100, you would make $7 and a quarter. Okay? Now, in what period of time will an investment of $100 double itself? So I want my final value to be 200. My initial is 100.07, and I'm looking for the time that it takes to do this. All right, so how do I solve this equation? We want to get the E by itself. So we're going to divide by 100. We get 2 equals E to the 0 0.07T. Now, how do I get this for T? Right, because we remember that the natural log of E to something will just be the something, right? They mutually destroy each other. So I'm going to take the natural log of both sides, and that's how we get rid of E. So we've got natural log of 2 equals natural log of E to the 0.07T. They mutually destroy each other. We wind up with natural log of 2 equals 0.07T. If I want T by itself, what do I got to do? Divide by 0.07. T is going to be equal to the natural log of 2 divided by 0.07. approximately 9.9 .9 years. Okay. Is anybody getting lost in this? Okay. Now, we just showed a doubling time, how long it took to double. It's, this doubling time is related to exponential growth rate k. Okay? So, we can say that t, the doubling time, is equal to the natural log of 2 divided by k. It's always going to work out that way because if, let's look at this equation. If we've got this, twice of this, whatever twice of this is, will always wind up with e to the kt equals 2. Right? Because we're going to have to divide the initial into the what we're looking for. It's always going to be twice that, so it's always going to be 2. Okay? Do we see that? That always has to be. If I started with 100 and ended with 200, 200 divided by 100 is 2. If I started with 200 and ended with 400, 400 divided by 200 is still 2. Okay? So we will always wind up with natural log of t equals kt, or divide by k. Our doubling time will always be natural log of 2 over k. Always. So if we remember that, we don't have to do the work. We don't have to set the equation up. We just say, well, OK, I know it's natural log of 2 over k. So if we say the worldwide use of the internet is increasing at an exponential rate, with traffic doubling every 100 days. What's the exponential growth rate? So how are we going to do this? Well, we know in 100 days we've doubled, right? So we're looking at 2 equals e to the k times 100 if we're doing it in days.
So natural log of 2 equals k times 100 divided by 100. k will be the natural log of 2 divided by 100. Which makes sense that if the doubling time, if t is equal to natural log of 2 over k, that k would be the natural log of 2 over t. Does that make sense? Since the k and the t are right there together, solve for one should be the same as solving for the other, with the only exception being those letters. Okay? So you get 0 0.06. I wouldn't even write that as a decimal. I would leave it as e to the natural log of 2 over 100 t. But that's just me. If you want to write it out as a decimal approximation, no problem. Oh, but it's, it is asking for the growth rate. So it is asking for the actual growth rate. So you probably would do that if you divide it out. You get 0 0.006931. And as a percentage, that's just 0.69%. I wonder if that's true. I wonder if the internet, the number of people using the internet doubles every 100 days. Kind of cool. Oh, good Lord. Yeah, that's. All right, so if the world population was approximately 6.04 billion at the beginning of 2000, and it's been estimated the population is growing exponentially at 1.6% per year, okay? This means we've got dp over dt equals. 0.016p. Now we're looking at since time, our model here is starting in the year 2000. Our time t is just the number of years after 2000, right? We don't do before 2000, we just do from 2000 on. So 2010, what is t going to be equal to? 10, because it's 10 years after 2000, okay? So we want to find the function that satisfy the, satisfies the equation. We're given what p naught is, and we're given what k is. So this is pretty straightforward, right? Because our function is y equals p naught e to the kt. So that's just going to be 6.0400 e to the 0.016t. All right, now we want to estimate the world's population. I'm going to write this up here. Estimate the world population at the beginning of 2020. So all we have to do is just plug in. That's T, not K. Sorry. All we have to do is plug in T equals 20. So we get... 6.04 e to the 0 0.016 times 20. And what will we get? Eight point three two. Let's do eight point three one seven. And this is billions, right? So we're looking at 8.3 billion people by 2020. How long will it take to double? In what year will we have double the population we had in 2000? Well, I know that our doubling time t is just equal to the natural log of 2 divided by k. So that's natural log of 2 divided by 0 0.016, which is going to give us what? 43.32. So 
after 43 years, so in 2043, we'll have 12 billion people. Okay? That's in our lifetime. If, if this model holds. That's frightening. All right, so now we want to talk about limited growth. Hold on. I don't want to do limited growth. We're only going to do uninhibited growth. And then we're going to go over to, since we've done growth, now we're going to do decay. So now what we're looking at is a function that satisfies not the derivative equals kp, but the derivative equals negative kp. Okay, this is the difference between growth and decay, whether k is positive or negative. We want to talk about decay rate and half-life, very similar to doubling time, right? We're talking about how long does it take to half the amount we had, and then solve applied problems involving exponential decay. So everything here is exactly the same as it was with growth, with one exception the k is now negative instead of positive. We still have an initial quantity of p sub naught, which is going to be our initial value. Only difference, like I said, is that negative k. That chair is actually broken. And I'm about to fall on the floor, so I'm changing chairs. All right. So look at growth versus decay when we graph them. Why does negative k give us decay when positive k gives us growth? Well, we know E is a positive number, right? We know it's a positive, well, we know it's a positive number greater than 1. Because remember, our rule was if A to the X if A is greater than 1, you have exponential growth. If A is greater than 1, you have growth. If A is between 0 and 1, that's when we had this decay. We had that fraction to an exponent. We'll look at e to the kt versus e to the negative kt. So, this is a number greater than 1 to a variable. That's growth. This, that negative, can be taken care of by changing it into a fraction, right? e to the negative 1 is just 1 over e. So now we have 1 over e to the kt. This is a value that is greater than 0 but less than 1. That's why we wind up with decay. That's how we can see the difference between these two things and why a negative exponent gives us decay. Okay? Now the decay rate and the half-life are related by the exact same function that doubling time is. Half-life will always be natural log of 2 divided by t, or divided by k. And the uh, time it takes will always be natural log of t divided by k. The time it takes and the k will always be natural log of t 2 divided by t, however long it took. Okay, so assuming plutonium, plutonium 239 uh, has a decay rate of 0.0028% per year, what's its half life? Well, we know that the rate is going to be our k, right? So, oh, what did I do wrong? If you even saw what I did. 
that's percentage, right? So I've got to add some zeros. Half of what? No, because remember, this is the formula for half-life. It is. But remember, half-life in decay is the same thing as doubling time in growth. Right? Mm -hmm. It just has to deal with whether we're growing or decaying. But otherwise, it's the exact same concept. So what's natural log of 2 divided by 0 0.000028? 0 Almost 25,000 years. And we have tons of it stored as byproduct of nuclear reactions. And it will take 25,000 years just for half of it to go away. <laughs> it's all over the place there. <laughs> OK. What's the half-life of cesium-137? Now, y'all do this and put it on your board. Yes. So we know that t is just natural log of 2 divided by k. k is 0 0.023. So natural log of 2 divided by 0 0.023 is roughly 30.14 years. All right, so the half-life of barium is 13 days. What's the decay rate? So now we want to solve for k not T. So, remember these formulas are exactly alike except P and K are just backwards. So in this case, K is natural log of 2 over T. But T is 13 days. So what's natural log of 2 divided by 13? So we're looking at a 5.3% decay per day. Now, is 5.3 correct? 5.3 is just a number, right? It doesn't really tie into what we're talking about. So we need to make sure and write it as 5.3%, but it's 5.3% per day. 
per day. The decay has to be over a, a time, you know, it has to be over a specific amount of time. Since we did this in days, this will be per day. Okay? So make sure your units are on here. All right, here's a good application. Carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,730 years. The amount of carbon in uh, different things, plants, animals, can be used to determine their age. So archaeologists have found that the linen wrappings from one of the Dead Sea Scrolls had lost 22.3% of its carbon-14. How old was that linen wrapping? This is what a lot of times they use for dating old stuff because we can measure how much carbon is in something and we can tell how much has been lost. So if we've lost 22.3%, how old was the linen wrappings? What does 22.3% represent? It represents what we would have if we did initial, final, and divided them out and got 22.3%. Okay? You can think about this as being 22, or 0.223 equals E to the negative KT. Because what we'll assume is our initial amount was one our final amount was 22.3% of 1, which is 0.223, okay? So we need to know, well, what's K and what's T? You know, what are we solving for? We're solving for T. How do we find K? Yeah, we're going to use that half-life, right? Because we know that 5730 is the half-life, and that's equal to the natural log of 2 divided by K. So if we multiply by K, and then divide by 5730, we get that formula that K is equal to the natural log of 2 over T. So what's the natural log of 2 divided by 5730? K equals 0 0.00012096811, whatever. So if we plug that in up here, 0 0.223 equals e to the negative 0 0.000120 blah 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 t. So we need to take the natural log of both sides. Natural log of 0.223 is equal to negative 0.000120t divide by negative 0.000120. So you get Twelve thousand five hundred five. So we've got Dead Sea Scrolls that are dated to twelve thousand five hundred years ago. I had a friend give me a Bible this weekend. 
and I was looking over it. It's got a, chrono a chronology in the back of it where it's got dates that it, things that happened and it's got the creation listed at like 4000 BC and uh, it's got a big disclaimer that says this is based on you know Schumer's findings or whoever and do not necessarily reflect the accuracy of you know whatever and I was like well according to this you're right <laughs> you know if we can date the Dead Sea Scrolls back to 12,000 that's a little bit further back than just 4,000 BC so but who says that uh, this is a a very open to interpretation science unfortunately there are people that debunk carbon-14 dating for a living so What do you mean? You mean the calendar? Well, the calendar shouldn't matter. It's 12,505 years in terms of Julian years. But the 4,000 BC is assuming a Julian dating system, too, so I assume it's a Julian. Maybe Gregorian. You know the difference between the Julian calendar and the Gregorian calendar? Yeah, they're very similar. They, uh, I think the Gregorian calendar didn't have leap days in it, and it got really funky. And it, you know, when they switched over to the Julian calendar, they had to change like 30 to 50 years. I mean, they had to change a lot. It, it jumped from like this is year 204 to this is year 234. You know, all of a sudden, so it had to have been good times to be alive. It's like I just got 30 years older today. Woohoo! <laughs> Not that it ma most people didn't even know what a year was, you know, they're like, I don't know, what it's the year of the sun, you know, whatever. <laughs> All right, so how old is a skeleton if it's lost 60% of its carbon-14? So we already found K, right? We know that K is equal to 0 .000120. Because it's carbon-14, K is still the same. This is going to be set up as 0 0.60 equals E to the 0 0.000120T. So we take the natural log of both sides. Negative, I'm sorry, negative 0 0.000120t divided by negative 0 Uh -huh. What did I do wrong? <laughs> it's lost 60%, right? So what's left? It's only 40%, right? got a number and I'm looking at it going, no, that's not right. Well, that don't look right.
Do I have K-Rat? So what am I? Same thing I did wrong in this problem. I did this problem wrong because I did 70, I did 22.3 instead of what was left. Right, it lost 22.3, so, oh, I hate when I do something wrong. I know y'all hate it too. This should have been, instead of 0 0.223, 0.777. Do y'all see why? If it lost 22.3, how much is left? That's the value that's on the left-hand side is what's left. So that would have been 0 0.777, 0 0.777. You get. 2,103 years. Which is better? Because I'm pretty sure the Dead Sea Scrolls talk about Jesus, don't they? Not those Christian things. So 12,000 years ago wouldn't make any sense. So, back to the other one. Now, see, oh, because they, now, this is going to show you something. When they do it, they did it out to a further decimal, they get a different answer. At this, at these values, you can get some really drastically different answers when you do roundings. And it's, it's good to know that. Be aware that I know that and that when you're doing these problems for a test, it's better generally to keep as many decimals as you can just for uh, exactness as much as you can be. But if you're in the ballpark, as long as I see that you've set the problem up right and that you're doing it right, I know that you're okay. okay? So in this one, We do the same thing. So how old will that skeleton be? About 7,500 years old. All right. Say there's a birth and the grandparents want to make an investment so that this investment will grow and then on the, 20th, the child's 20th birthday, they'll have $10,000. How much do the grandparents need to invest if it's compounded continuously at 6%? So how do we set this up? Ten, yeah, 10,000 is what we want, right? And it's going to be equal to our initial investment, which we don't know, E to the RT. What's the rate? 0 0.06. And what's T? 20 years. So 
So what's e to the 0.06 times 20? Twenty one, so twenty one point two three six seven three one. Did I do it right? I'm using a different calculator than I normally use. Three point three two. If you don't put the 0.06 times 20 in parentheses, then it thinks you're doing e to the 0.06, and then that times 20. So make sure if you're using your calculator that you put the 0.06 and the 20 in parentheses, and you should get 3.32. Well, 0.06 times 20 is 1.2. So e to the 1.2 is 3.32. No. No. This is not decay. This is actually a growth problem. I don't know why it's in the K section, but remember, this is just interest. We just we did this in the last section, you know. So when we divide by 3.32, we get an initial investment of three thousand twelve dollars and five cents. And here we have a rounding error, so they, they wound up with a little a little different from us, but well they didn't round, you know, we said that e to the one point two was three point three two. They didn't round it, they left that entire value in. So if I do 10,000 divided by e to the 1.2, I get 3,011.94. So, yeah, it's just a rounding error. So is it 1.2 or 3.32? It's e to the 1.2. e to the 1.2 is 3.32. They just didn't say e to the 1.2 equals 3.32. Do e to the 1.2. Give me your calculator. <laughs> uh, 3.32. Let's see. 1.2 e 3.32. Okay. To use e to the x or y to the X, you have to put the exponent first. 1.2 and hit e to the x. That's what I did and it didn't. It just blinked again. Like I'm sorry. I don't know what to tell you. Sometimes I can just touch them and they work. All right. Thus, the grandparents need to invest a little over $3,000. We're not going to do it for 4%. All right. Theorem 11 tells us. 
that the present value of an amount due t years later at an interest rate of k compounded continuously is given by p naught equals p e to the negative kt. This is very similar to uh, that growth model we just did. We're just doing it backwards. Okay? We're saying if p equals p naught e to the rt, right? This is what we just did using the growth model. If we want to know what our initial investment is, we just solve for p naught, divide by e to the rt, e to the rt. That gives us p sub naught equals p e to the rt is in the denominator, I can bring it up to the numerator and make it negative. So all we really did was just solve it for p naught, and then it becomes a decay problem. Because you're starting with a high value and you want to know what the low value associated with it is. If you don't want to remember this formula, there's no reason to, because it's just a straight derivation from the growth model. And if you remember PERT for compounded interest, then you can remember, you know, PERT with a negative gives you the backwards of it. Now, something completely different. Newton's law of cooling. This is a really cool application, and we're not going to do it. All right, so we have finished sections 3.1, 2, 3, and 4. That's all that she wrote for chapter 3. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to go through it. I'm going to tweak the homework and make sure there's no homework questions that deal with uh, inhibited growth and lo Newton's law of cooling, first off. And then I'm going to make a take-home test. So what I want you to do is Friday morning I'll post a take-home test that will be due Monday when we get back from spring break. So you've got plenty of time to work on it. Uh, if for some reason you're going to miss class on Monday, I'll need you to scan it and email it to me or take pictures of you know, whatever, and send it to me so that I have it on Monday because there's no excuse for not turning it in on Monday. Okay? Does that make sense? Everybody good with that? If you've got any questions about it, uh, come and you know, see me if... Well, if it's tomorrow, you, you won't have it yet. Uh, email me. Remind me. Let me know if you've got issues that you need uh, dealing with. Okay? Yes, ma'am. I will. I'll, I'll be doing that this afternoon. Homework will be due uh, probably Sunday before we come back. I think, I, think, I think I've changed it already, and I think that's what I changed it to. If I didn't, I will make sure and check it and, and uh, so that it will be the Sunday before we come back. All right, anybody have any questions? All right, we'll see you all after spring break. You all have a good break.